Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Hanks. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Clemson University in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Conservation, and I work in the Baltimore Conservation Laboratory. Today I'm going to be talking to you about systematic spatial conservation planning. Why are we developing a spatial conservation plan in the Congaree Biosphere region when there are other plans like the South Atlantic Landscape Conservation Cooperative Blueprint and the South Carolina Conservation Bank's Conservation Priority Map? These plans already encompass the biosphere. The reason is really a question of scale. What scale works best for conservation to make the most impact through stakeholder engagement and on-the-ground conservation efforts? Differences of scale in both time and space allow for various biophysical processes to occur, whereas reproduction occurs at one spatial and temporal scale, climate change occurs at quite a different scale. We need planning to span these scales. However, through the planning effort we did for it, for the Appalachian Landscape Conservation Cooperative branded Naturescape, we heard that much of the plan didn't work for local stakeholders. It was too coarse. We believe that the spatial extent of the biosphere region is an appropriate geography for optimizing conservation efforts. There are multiple tools that we use as conservation planning in conservation planning that incorporate our understanding of ecological systems and with the constraints of our socio-political systems. Systematic spatial conservation planning is just one of those many tools that conservationists use to accomplish their goals. So what is systematic spatial conservation planning? Systematic spatial conservation planning is a quantitative approach to systematically assess and provide informed decision-making power to stakeholders regarding where action is needed, when action is needed, what action is required, how much action is required, and why action is required. More generally, this means where should we invest our limited conservation resources across a given landscape? Systematic spatial conservation planning is needed because ecological patterns and processes are being impacted at the landscape scale. We define landscape scale as a spatial and temporal scale that allows for multi-generational population processes to occur. Systematic spatial conservation planning also helps us achieve conservation goals while considering the threats that can hinder those goals. It provides a collaborative framework where input from a variety of stakeholders helps to achieve stated regional conservation goals. And a key factor that sets it apart from other conservation planning approaches is that it uses mathematical solutions to complex spatial problems. The overall goal of systematic spatial conservation planning is to provide a system of managed and protected areas which are representative of socio-ecological important species, ecosystems, cultural resources, and ecological processes all while considering that the future is both dynamic and uncertain. Systematic spatial conservation planning has multiple components that are driven by stakeholder engagement and input, where the overall goal is to achieve collectively held landscape con scale conservation. This sustainable and resilient socio-ecological landscape is achieved through planning that is iterative, collaborative, and holistic, which leads to a variety of spatially explicit and strategic products that includes analytical tools, maps, and strategies. Including all aspects of our conservation goals across space and time is a complex and difficult task. We use the word care to help us remember the fundamental principles for systematic spatial conservation plan. In doing so, we hope to protect both biodiversity, the livelihoods of people who depend on it, and a specific quality of life. A plan that adheres to the care principle is connected, adequate, representative, and efficient. A connected plan allows species to travel unimpeded, or relatively so, across the landscape to ensure long-term persistence of the full range of a species habitat needs. This allows biophysical processes and habitat requirements for a variety of species of different life stages to be linked across the landscape. An adequate plan provides enough habitat and species protections to ensure their persistence through time. A representative plan captures and protects all of the species and habitats present. Should this should also include spatial replication. And an efficient plan, all locations taken together achieve the goals of the least, at the least cost. This reduces the impact on people while meeting the objectives of the other three components. Now let's take a look at an example. If we consider a hypothetical example where we are interested in the conservation of an aquatic system, you see that we have a single target, suitable spawning substrate, and a protected riparian areas all along a stream network. In conservation planning, we need to break the landscape up into some definable spatial unit. Here you see hexagons, but this can also be represented by watersheds, for example. So in the example here, we have 24 planning units, one target species, and three habitat requirements. 
Now let's take a look at the spatial relationships of our species and physical habitat. You'll notice that in the upper section of that in the headwaters, there is suitable riparian areas and substrate, but in the downstream dam acts as a barrier to the connectivity of required habitat for fish species we are interested in protecting. In the lower portion of the figure, you'll notice that there, are, there seems to be no barrier to fish movement into the headwaters where spawning substrate is located. There is an agricultural facility that could act as a barrier due to possible runoff, but the riparian area is protected and so, in this hypothetical example, it does not act as a barrier to fish migration. Whereas in the upper portion of the figure, you will see a planning unit with an agricultural facility and with no riparian protection resulting in fish being unable to make their way to the next planning unit, regardless of there being a dam there. So, what should we protect? It seems reasonable that we should protect the lower stream section that connects all of our biophysical requirements for the simple aquatic example. But what happens if we begin to add other targets? So now consider four targets. You can see that it becomes a much more complex planning situation. Recall that adequate means that we need to need enough of each species and habitat type to ensure their long-term success. This should include such potential impacts from the stresses of land use and land use change and climate change. Remember, we want to maintain connectivity for our aquatic target and associated habitat requirements. Additionally, our plan, for our plan to be adequate, we need enough of each species and habitat to ensure their long-term success. This requires a good knowledge of the spatial requirements for all of the targets. You will notice that in our connected aquatic plan, the planning units already contain some representation of the other targets. Maybe we could start by simply looking at the number of targets represented in each planning unit. What if we decided to protect the planning units with the three or greater targets? This example shows only adequacy in terms of the species being represented within the planning unit. However, it does not indicate if their habitat requirements are needed, nor does it consider connectivity. Now, what if we, if the bird species or bird target we are interested in is an endangered species? We probably want to consider conserving all of the planting units where it is known to occur. Now that our plan seems to be connected and adequate, we want to ensure that all species and habitats that are represented, that are present in the planting region are represented and spatially replicated. So, in addition to the current area proposed to be protected, we need to ensure the special bog habitat in the upper right of the re right region is also conserved. Because the future is uncertain and unpredictable, the spatial replication built into the plan where species and habitats are replicated is more than in more than one planning unit, helps protect against various forms of disturbance or catastrophe. For example, natural disasters or changes in land use that can be catastrophic for our conservation plan are mitigated against by this spatial replication. In the example here, we lost one of our bog habitats to a natural disaster and two planting units within our endangered bird were lost to development. However, each have been spatially replicated and so they can persist within the region. At this point, we need to work towards minimizing impacts our conservation plan has on people and try to mitigate potential conflicts that can arise between livelihoods in conservation, including those livelihoods that depend on conserved conserve biodiversity. We need a spatial plan that is efficient. You can see here that we have provided space in our plan for the development of a nearby neighborhood that is close to the city where there are potential jobs. Additionally, we may, due to constraints on financial resources, lose some of the important bird habitat. However, we still maintain about 70% of the bird habitat in our plan. Let's now take a look at another example where your job is to identify the smallest number of planning units while conserving all of the identified targets. In this simple example, by ensuring all targets are met, we are being representative, and by selecting the fewest number of targets, we are being efficient. I'll give you 15 seconds to come up with a solution.
It might seem sensible to select the planning unit with the most targets represented, which would be planning unit one with eight targets. However, you'll notice that there are two targets yet to be protected, the Gopher Frog and the Eastern Diamondback. To protect these two targets, you will also need to select planning units three and five. This is often the result of spatial overlay models where the spatial unit with the most targets or layers is prioritized. However, recall that we are also trying to be good stewards of our conservation resources. So, greedy is not good. You'll notice that if you select the planning units three and five, while each only has five targets, you reach your representative plan while being much more efficient. This example I've shown the, in, in the presentation, these examples I've shown in the presentation are all simple examples, but the difficulties become apparent when you start to consider a large spatial plan or a large extent with many more targets. In the plans that you will see represented hereafter for the Congaree Biosphere Reserve, there are 7,901 planning units and 11 integrated targets. Because of the exponential increase in complexity with additional planning units and targets, we rely on computer software programs such as Marksan that are aimed at creating a spatial plan that is connected, adequate, representative, and efficient.